You can see that we are still here at the uh, water hole. Oh, here comes the crocodile approaching a little island not very far away from where we are. So it was difficult to spot a crocodile this afternoon. Look at that. So you can see that this crocodile is just about to uh, climb the wall. Maybe it's going to come out or not. We're just going to wait and see what is going to happen. And a very, very a good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the normal drive. This is Sydney Fumura Mikosi together with Craig, my camera operator. You can follow us on Twitter. You can also send your questions on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. Follow us on YouTube too. So the crocodiles are not coming out a lot. I was here a few days ago and the crocodiles, they were just uh, submerged. It doesn't look like an animal. You can see when it's there. It is like a dead tree. So this is one of the dangerous predators because when they catch something, they drag it onto the water hole and suffocate it. Some of the animals, they get lucky because hippopotamus, they do defend them. That is uh, a lovely call. Uh, Elizabeth, we are indeed ex expecting some rain. It has been predicted for tomorrow, which is a Thursday. But, you know, the weather is always um, unpredictable. It might change. We might get some rain today or not get some rain tomorrow. So not quite a lot of animals are coming to drink here at the moment. Um, I'm sure this is due to the fact that there is quite a lot of water around the reserve at the moment. There's quite a lot of birds. The armor falcons are very much uh, excited here at the moment. So now let's uh, go back to Steve and hear how his leopard search is going. Thanks, Sydney. Well, we are searching and searching and uh, we haven't yet come across any male leopard, but I'm pretty sure if he's anywhere around here, he's going to be flat in the shade. But we've been going along the drainage, along the dry riverbed and looking at all these little watering points. It's amazing how leopards will still drink from them even when they're very muddy. So this is still quite clean in comparison. We saw how Tingana and Hosanna was drinking from very muddy water and treehouse dam, even twin dams towards the end of the season. So this is still quite doable. So it's always important to come and have a look at these little pans and little wallows and see are there any tracks because if he's coming out a drink he's probably just moved off away somewhere and is hiding just underneath a small bush in the shade because it is still quite warm um, the rain is teasing us it's in the distance we can smell it we had some drops on us but no respite for us this afternoon some hyena tracks an elephant rhino Hello Taz, yes we've been looking for Hosanna, uh, we had him this morning very briefly, we, we saw his bottom, so I'm thinking it was Hosanna, um, by the tracks it seemed to be him anyway, but uh, he didn't stick around, we tried to follow up, but he moved off and into the Muwati drainage system, it's quite dense and quite thick, it was very hard to follow him any further in, it. then we ran out of time, so we'll just try to have a little scratch around this afternoon, coming to some of his favorite areas and maybe we'd find him but a good chance he is flat so we've been looking very hard but he might just be lying down underneath a thicket somewhere so we might move off go do some other things and then as it cools down maybe move back into this area because you know once it cools down it's a lot easier for these animals to move around and 
Well then, they generally just pop out in the road for us and then there's not that much work required. But we're just going to do a bit of a loop around this block see if we can find any of his tracks that maybe came across because we left him inside here this morning and uh, well just do a little quiet little drive along here there's a very nice drainage down here that he might have moved along and if he hasn't come across then he's probably still in there enjoying some shade because well since we left him this morning it hasn't got any cooler so a good chance that he's done absolutely nothing if he's got a kill somewhere, we don't know about it. Um, if he might be feeding on it if he does have one. But there is a good chance that he went and had a drink at one of the small pans or puddles around. But the problem is there are so many of them around at the moment. But down here in these little depressions where it's nice and cool, we almost feel like we want to just park off underneath the tree for a little bit. Just to get a little bit of shade. Look at that. Very nice and beautiful down here. I've had Tandy in here a number of times mm, we could have brought a blanket emma indeed and had a little sundown and a picnic in the drainage depression dave and i were actually just chatting about that that one of these days we're going to get everybody together and go and have ourselves a little bit of a pool party yeah pool party for all the juma stuff all the people that are going to be grinning and bearing the heat during the christmas period we're going to have some fun as well you know obviously it'll be a sober affair <laughs> have to be if we're working okay so we're gonna keep going through here this is an area where we could potentially have any of the cats moving through we're probably gonna find an elephant at some stage but in the meantime David has found some lions Very good. Good luck on Hosanna. And I think I've got some luck on some cuts. And seeing a vulture there, it would mean maybe this vulture is scavenging on something. And I think that's the hooded vulture. And if it's scavenging on something, definitely the killers are not very far. And there they are appearing on the screen one after the other. I'm guessing this is the marsh pride. We've got so many lion prides in the Mara and this particular pride here is called the marsh pride they're just next or close to the marsh and they must have gotten something last night I do not know what they brought down I just found them here and this particular one here it's so full and of course if a cat is full is happy that's exactly what lions do they just tend to go flat so that's number two and I think now that is the big guy and the male belongs to a coalition of lions. Oh, it's a zebra, definitely. I can tell, I can see a bit of black and white there. So it's a zebra, and either they're having a bit of a fight as they feed there. I've seen many predators, not many predators that eat peacefully, apart from maybe the wild dogs. But you can see the lions there were having a little scuffle. And the male there must be from the Kichwa males. We're not very far from that territory, and this territory is controlled and run by the Kichwa males, which has three main boys, three big males, and definitely that must be one of them. We have one that we call the half tail, and there's another male that we call Fang, and another one. So I do not know who this is because he's eating facing the other way, and you can tell those lionesses are so full and they're having the best. Oops! See how males. Well, is he fighting another male or some females there? Somehow, the lions, I would say, have no table manners. And males, more often than not, they tend to control the dining table. In general, like in a pride like this, I would say, the females do the bigger job of stalking, laying ambush, and finally hunting, you know, the, the prey. But the males always tend to take advantage of that. I'm sure you had seen me before, and for those who may not have seen me earlier, my name is David, that has not changed, and with me today is Archie. Archie, how is it going? Archie is excited, just like me, to have seen the lions. Remember, we're always on a very interactive safari. Should you have any questions or any comments, please don't forget to send them through, hashtag Safari Life, and you can also keep following us on the YouTube chat stream. This is the Mara Triangle and it's one wilderness as beautiful as it is like in Joma. Rosaline, vultures are scavengers or we sometimes you call them uh, raptors and they are very good in smelling, I would say, 
any kill. I like that vulture you see there, which I guess that could be the hooded vulture. What they do when they're flying, like say during the day, they use heat thermos. They've got wonderful sight. If they don't smell like hyenas, because hyenas, I think they've got a better sense of smell than vultures. Vultures, their sight, I would say, it's just wonderful. So come morning, they start flying a little bit, and as the day warms up, there's enough thermos in the air. They use the heat thermos to look on the ground. And definitely, like these lions here, they'll definitely spot them. And what they'll do, they'll come to trees close to them and wait until the killers leave, and then they'll scavenge and what, in what's left behind. So I'd say well done to the Marsh Pride. They've got some shelf, some dinner. It could be early this morning or last night. I'm not very sure what time. They brought this zebra down. But I'm sure they have got enough to eat for everybody. This male here is quite aggressive and like, you know what? Eat me to eat. And that's not unusual. We have seen many times the females doing all the job. And even before they start eating, once the males pick it up, they just arrive in style. Now, we've got two females there, I guess, and this one particular male. You can see the size of this boy here. Look at his big men. And should he feel that the females are eating so much, he just growls at them. And they, they you know, step back <laughs> or they fight then go back to eating. Well, I'll continue watching this and maybe what I'll be doing for the next few minutes, I will look for a different position, maybe reposition myself and then see whether I'll be able to see the faces of this beautiful cat. Meanwhile, I'll take you back to South Africa to Stivovo. Thanks, David. Well, we are still, we've, as soon as we went off from you, we found some tracks of a female leopard. Judging by the area, it could have been Tandy, but unfortunately, They've been driven all over from this morning, I think. But uh, there's an area she used to frequent. I'm trying to think when last I saw her. She definitely likes this area here a lot. And on the left-hand side here, I've found her and spent much time with her in these areas. But uh, unfortunately, if she has been walking along the road for quite a distance, I can't see it. But uh, we're going to still keep doing our little loop here. Just because the, the little chief's tracks would be on top of a vehicle tracks from this morning if he did come out there's nothing so far so there's a good chance he's still in there and once we know that he's still in there well then it makes it a bit easier later when we come we we'll just obviously a little bit of luck as well involved in in moving through the areas trying to find him but sometimes luck is on our side isn't it Davi mm-hmm Driving very slowly through, although if we did drive faster, the cool breeze in our face would be so much more rewarding. But uh, tracking this time of year on the ground is a bit trickier, because when there's been rain, the ground is a bit harder. Uh, even tracking, I mean, on the road, it's probably a bit easier because of the vehicle movement and the tracks on the road. Vehicle churns up the soil, makes it a bit easier to see tracks. But once you go off-road there, the tracking can be very, very difficult. Even Herbie this morning, our expert tracking professional, was having a hard time. Obviously he, he whizzed through it of course, but a little bit harder than in the, the winter months. First of all, you can see much further as well, and you don't get surprised by so many elephants in the winter because you know where they are. Now, I mean we bumped into two herds this morning and didn't even know they were there. Of course Herbie knew they were there, but me with one deaf ear because of the earpiece, sometimes it's hard to hear where these things are coming from. Christine, you would like to see Hukumuri, would you? Well, Hukumuri and I, we've got a special little relationship. Um, he likes to show me warthogs that he catches. I haven't seen him in ages. Um, I haven't seen a Juma leopard apart from was sauna this morning in three months. Can you believe that? Wow. So I haven't seen Hukumuri in months. It's been a long time. Um, this afternoon, I mean, hopefully we're going to find Hosana for you. We might be lucky and just bump into Tandi. Uh, and you know how it works sometimes because the leopards haven't been, haven't been seen for the last few days. All three, Hukumuri, no, all three, Tandi, um, Tingana and Tandi. Oh, 
<laughs> with Shana, might just pop out and have a bit of a family reunion. Tristan was getting lots of that while I was up in the mire. I was super jealous watching all these activities of those three leopards. Just ridiculous, as he said. And then it happened again, and it's like, this is a ridiculous times too, you know? Anyway, I think before I left, before I left, I was just down the road here with Seb. Before I left to go to go up to the Mara, Seb and I had uh, Hosanna on a Nyala kill in a tree, and Tingana came running. Tristan was following Tingana. Tingana came running and displaced him out the tree. And a few days before that, I had uh, Tingana killing a warthog. Warthogs, well, they don't do very well here. Leopards really do enjoy them. Okay, well, we're still looking very deliberately on the ground. Oh, feel the breeze. That is lovely. Can you, you show them that lovely ominous cloud coming there, Darby? Is that a bit tricky? Come on, Rain. We need you so badly. We need you. We need you. It's coming, but it's, uh, it's very far away. We haven't heard any noises. You can kind of see the rain falling. It looks quite ominous from FC Emma saying, but um, hopefully the wind is going to change and it's going to blow in here and we're going to get a nice downpour. We've put the roofs on to preempt it. That's what happens if we'd left the roofs off. You know, it would have been raining already. But we've got to be good boys to make sure we don't get all the equipment wet and, and damaged. Am I right, Davi? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, here comes the wind. The wind is coming. Hopefully the rain will come with it. Well, anyway, Sydney, I think, has left Chitwa Dam. I think he might be popping over to Torchwood, but let's go and have a look. Uh, this afternoon, I am going to a Torchwood. Maybe I might be lucky with a Tandy or a Kalamba by Torchwood. So I'm just about to enter Torchwood now. So I haven't seen Kalamba and Tandy for quite a long time. Let's hope this afternoon is our day to see them. Six, I did not um, copy your question very well to do with a Talamba. <laughs> uh, Carl Six, uh, Talamba has been uh, um, alone for quite a while now and they have been spotted there. Sometimes they are seen together but most of the time Talamba is just by herself. So I'm sure now she is very well experienced. Maybe she is learning now how to hoist a kill up into the tree. So I am hoping at <laughs> Jonathan, indeed, Kalamba is quite a very big girl by now, I am sure. I'm just trying to check here because we saw some lion tracks also in the area, looking very fresh. And I just want to at least use the road where we might also be lucky with them if they are heading towards the water hole. We are already inside the touch wood at the moment. It is a very much green. I just got back to the border a little bit so that I can use the road, which is parallel to where the lion tracks are. I just want to try and hit two beds with one stone. <laughs> mm. Lots of impalas, so um, Talamba has got quite a lot to eat in this area. She must be growing a lot by now.
Enlu, this, uh, if you can check, there's quite a lot of uh, contradictions from different uh, information sources. Some will tell you lions can run 80 kilometers per hour, which is 22.2 meters per second full speed. And that is very fast. So they don't run that fast for uh, quite a long time. It's just for a short distance. And normally if they don't catch, they give up. <laughs> oh, there's some old labor tracks as well where I am. At least now we're starting to build more confidence that here we are at a possible area for the lepers. <laughs> the Unkuhumas, I saw them very far away from here. Uh, I saw them when they were uh, crossing uh, towards, uh, they were crossing the Triple M, which is a road bordering us by the southern side with the other reserves. So they are not here. This is not their tracks. They are very far. In terms of kilometers, I can say they have crossed more than five kilometers away from where we are. And uh, they crossed after they came out from Buffalo's Hook. They were not coming from this direction. Uh, competition is too high. Steve is also in search of the leopards. And let's see how his search is doing. Mm, competition, sitters. I didn't know we were having a competition. We were just, you know, driving around to see what we could find. Obviously, we'd like to find a leopard, but um, he's still in the block here somewhere. No tracks have come out. I know um, that Sydney's had some luck with Clalumbo over the last few weeks on Torchwood. I haven't been on Torchwood as well in some time, so looking forward to getting over there. But um, yeah, it would be lovely to find your leopard. It's definitely starting to cool down. The cloud cover is covering the sun, so we're not getting any more thermal radiation, which is quite nice. You can just see it through the gap there in the sky. And the sun that's still supposed to be up for a little while has gone and set on us now. But um, Rick, why is weather unpredictable? Well, the thing is, in the, the low felt here, when we're in the summer months, the sun is directly above us, okay? Normally in the winter, the sun is, sorry, at that angle, so it reflects off the earth and doesn't give too much solar radiation. But in the summer months, you get this heat coming down and it causes all sort of convection currents, moisture, evaporation, and electricity, and that leads to thunderstorms. But because we don't have any mountains nearby here, the, the rain has developed there around the escarpment which is probably about 70 80 kilometers from where we are so about 40 odd miles and um, so it needs to move up against a mountain like that to then pour down so it comes down from the mountains and then it just it dissipates in certain areas uh, it's called orographic rain in the area here and it doesn't fall in one place just because it's raining it doesn't mean the entire landscape is covered with rainfall so that is probably one of the major reasons but it's static electricity which often leads to lots of lightning and thunderstorms and the evaporation of all the moisture from the ocean and also from the land the, the bodies of water inland leads to enormous amounts of downpour but it is not guaranteed in a specific area you can get days or times when there's cyclones off the coast and huge amounts of moisture push in and that's a really big system that then covers the entire low felt uh, but that doesn't happen all the time these afternoon thunderstorms that we get are all a product basically of um, very hot weather during the day very very hot weather which we've been experiencing you generally get two maybe three days of really scorching hot and then thunderstorm comes 
washes it all down and sometimes we're not lucky we don't get it ourselves anyway we've done a big loop there's no tracks coming out so we're going to assume that he's probably just inside Nico Nico viewer you want to know if there's a typhoon coming I don't think we get typhoons here that I know of I know we get cyclones every now and again off the off the coastline off the Mozambican coast and that leads to to very big high weather spells lots of rain lots of wind um, but last one we had was a while ago it's not a guaranteed thing uh, but global warming is happening and we're seeing higher incidences of of flooding and cyclones and hurricanes and typhoons all over the world but Africa doesn't get too bad in the form of that so the cyclones we got I think three years ago were, were pretty crazy they really lifted sort of the sea level they caused all sorts of flooding along the coast and there was huge amounts of rain that fell all over the country I remember I happened to be driving it was not fun not fun when that happened anyway we're now heading north towards Buffalo Dam we've done a big loop around that area nothing coming out we're gonna have a look through this drainage line here is also a very popular one for our cats to hang out in nice and sort of shaded um, when it's hot shade is the way forward folks it really really is nice green comfortable grass and as I said before with little puddles of water like this there's so many of them around so generally in the dry season you find these puddles or you find the sort of water sources and the animals are generally quite localized to those but because they're all over the place these cats could really be anywhere elephant tracks up and down We've got a good chance of probably finding some elephants on our little while now. Safari Wild Man, you are 100% right there. When I came to Juma, I mean, he, you're basically saying that we see leopards so often that we, we forget that they're wild. You know, the leopards that we find in Juma is ridiculous for the amount of leopards we find. I think before I came to Juma, I only had a handful of leopards in like a year. In one entire year working in the bush, I maybe had three or four leopards in that entire year working and training in the bush or should I say three years I worked at eco training I think I got maybe maybe five leopards in three years so that is not a lot of leopards I got two leopards here on my interview drive so this place is ridiculous for cats and I know that everybody loves our leopards we do love our leopards I love I love the leopards here this time of year when it's wet when it's been raining when there's greenery around the animals are spread out that is much harder to find so we do try we will do our best but we're gonna have to also spend a lot of time getting into the trees and I've brought Trishala out with me this afternoon who's going to be taking over in a few minutes and who knows what wonderful information she's going to be sharing with you Dave is doing a little bit of a dance in the back there she is now as well so I just thought I would spend a little bit of time driving around see if we could find Osana and I'll be handing over the reins to her very shortly on our next little break and then who knows where she's going to take us I'm going to leave it all into her hands oh there's a woodpecker that's just gone into the tree you're not going to be able to see him I don't think he's gone into the le the knob thorn at the back there oh no he's not visible sorry about that it looked like a small woodpecker but uh, he's hidden he went into the hole in the tree everything's hiding from us this afternoon okay well we're gonna keep heading north as I suggested you're gonna be losing me in a few minutes but in the meantime let's go see how Sydney's getting on finding the elusive Columba I am still looking around the Touchwood area. No luck yet. Quite a lot of hyena tracks where I am at the moment. And uh, when the hyenas are roaming around, normally, as we have witnessed on several occasions, the leopards are around. So these hyenas, they are being assisted a lot by these leopards when it comes to the diet.
Jens, uh, unfortunately, uh, these vehicles, uh, they don't have a uh, tracking device for emergencies, but they do have a base radio. This base radio, I can be able to call the people for assistance to come from very far. So if anything happens here, I can be able to reach the office and the recovery vehicle will come and help us. Just want to confirm something here on this road. <laughs> I, I, I got stuck on several locations because sometimes in technical problem, technical issues, sometimes, issues, sometimes we do by the artifact holes and by these drainage lines, by these drainage lines, the vehicles now and with the 4x4 still do it. So then we call the others to come. So sorry about that guys, we seem to have a slight difficulty technically but nonetheless you have me and I am always excited to take you guys on board and remember please please communicate with us using that hashtag Safari Live and of course the YouTube chat stream. Now we are hopefully hot on the tail of Hosanna, probably not yet but we have been seeing some tracks and like wonderful Steve has said we are going north up to Buffles Hook. Now, I know I have driven with you guys some other times before and you know that I love the water holes. There's always so much happening. So that is where I intend to go right now. Of course, with always Hasana in mind. Now, actually speaking of Hasana, and S Steve did say to you, Steve did say to you that uh, on his interview drive, he saw Hasana twice. How lucky is that? Oh, well, leopards twice. Now, when I came for my interview drive, as soon as I entered the reserve, it must have been 50 meters from the gate, there he was, almost like he was welcoming me. I took it as a good omen and look, here I am in the hot seat. See, Darby remembers that he was with me. He picked me up that day. Old Hosanna. You know, you tend to actually fall in love with them a little bit his fidgety little tail and yes M says he's <laughs> such a good performer and yes he does he never disappoints Hosanna and coming from a, a scientific background you you don't actually you don't think of animals in that way or you don't think that you're going to have some sort of relationship or affection are tied to them but somehow he just crawls up in there and he steals your little heart or well, at least my little heart and i'm sure a lot of you view as well old hasana and we actually watch him watch him become the strong male leopard The viewers are wondering what other leopards I've seen. Well, I have seen Lalandi, and in fact, Lalanda has her own song for me now. La 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 la. That's my song for her. <laughs> for a little cat. Um, I remember uh, we sometimes if we have a sighting, then we'll as trainees we'll go out and we'll also have a look so we can learn as much as we. As we can. couldn't see her. 
could not see her and I, dro I drove right past and she was literally in the bush just looking up at me. Indescribable experiences. Oh, oh, the one I have to tell you about, Tingana. When I Tingana, well, actually do some own tests and then Seb was on the drone and it... Sure. I'm just going to share, maybe have a listen and then tell you my story. Everything seems quite quiet actually. Hmm. But Tingana, what a story. So here we are doing the drone testing and we have the thermal camera. Sorry, I just heard squirrel alarm calling now squirrels are unfortunately notoriously unreliable but this one seems quite persistent let's just listen for a few seconds Still going at it. Can you hear that, guys? I would like to actually, I would like to actually check that out. I hope that, M, is that okay? Like I said, we were having a few technical difficulties, so I'm just checking with him that it's okay. But I have to tell you my Tingana story. I'm not going to let it go. But while I look for whatever the squirrel is alarm calling at, let me send you over to David in the Masai Mara and see what he's got for you. Hey, Menuza. Well, Trish or the very best. Some of these birds are very good in helping to identify where a predator be. Some of these alarm calls are so real. Well, there's some alarm calls that are a bit different, and I'm talking of the vultures that you see on that tree there. It could be what I would call a very quiet alarm call. A very quiet alarm call in the sense that seeing vultures there will always translate to something they are waiting for. And something they are waiting for meaning there's something they would want to eat, but maybe the owners are still there, and the owners could be some type of predators. As you see there, we got this pride of lions that could be feeding in that particular area. And shortly, we're gonna be seeing who is there on, on the table. More of the vultures. Some of them have the courage to come down. There's a jackal there, you also see. The jackals also scavenge together with the vultures. It depends on who is stronger and who is closer to the dining table. And this marsh pride here, they're still feeding. And you can tell the pecking order here. This guy is or has been eating this meal for the last 20 minutes. And he's not allowing even that female so close to him even to touch the meat. This is the, I would say, the table manners that, that, sh that should be followed, males first, but I got a feeling the females might have eaten earlier. And you can see the jackal just on the edge, trying to come pretty close. For those who have never joined us before, we're in the Mara Triangle, and this is the Marsh Pride, and they brought down a zebra for themselves. I'm not sure whether it was early this morning, I would guess it must be early this morning, or during the day, because I counted about 10 lions, and 10 lions for a zebra, that's a very small male. I mean, a single lion, a single male on, you know, in, on, you know, in one sitting could eat 20% of its body, its body weight. And I'm giving that male there maybe 400 pounds. So 400 pounds could be like eating almost uh, 80 pounds. That's a lot of meat. And females would be eating the same. Of course, depending on whether they were allowed to eat earlier. By this particular male. This male is part of a coalition of males that we call the Kichwa males 
and the kitchomels are always a three. One is called fang and the other one is called halftail. And remember, our drive is always very interactive. Should you have any questions or any comments, please send them through hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. You can also keep following us on the YouTube chat stream. That one lioness must have fed much earlier, so full, and she's definitely not interested. The same case to these ones. I'm assuming that must have been the case. I didn't see the meeting, but from the look, you can tell the bellies don't look as bad. Now, this male with this beautiful mohawk is not allowing anybody else to eat. Early this morning, I had seen two other males of another coalition that called the Onlonyo Pike, but I won't think that this one, this particular male, comes out shining, handsome, bigger mane, much darker. And you can see the females on the other side sleeping, legs up, happy, and they are definitely must, they definitely must be very full. What would happen at one point, they may be leaving this area to go have a drink, and with all the short trains we have, this water all over where we are. I mean, and of course, they also get lots of water from the zebra as they eat the meat. We have seen them sometimes just sucking the blood from, you know, the ribcage of the prey that they bring down. So different types of vultures will be coming close to the kill here. And I'm guessing these ones are the hooded vultures. And these vultures might have to wait a little bit longer before they get close to the dining table. But I think Trish also has another blood sucker. Just I'm talking about this male lion sucking blood or getting blood from the ribcage of this zebra here. Look what I found, something else slightly spotty, but this time completely a different size to the spotty cat we're looking for. We have some ticks. Now, I think these are super, super, super interesting. Look at the color of it. Wonderful, I think. It's just sitting here in some love, uh, sawtooth love grass. That is what it is. And I think it quite resembles love, don't you think? Bit of, bit of pink, kind of like a heart. Maybe that's why the ticks are attracted to it. But I have seen these ticks on um, other plants as well. Now, I know that it's not a sort of beetle or a, a bug or hemoptera, a hemiptera, because it's got eight legs, which tells me that it is not part of the insect family. Sorry, David. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think they're quite cool. Now, we do know that they can spread quite a bit of disease. You know that they um, often suck blood out of maybe your pets at home and often on the antelope that we have here. And that the red-billed oxpeckers like to pick them off because they're tasty for them at least. I think they're quite cool. I've been seeing quite a few of them around I'd actually love to do a bit more research on them and find out exactly what type they are and what they're after because most of the time I've seen them on the plants and to me that doesn't make too much sense. But maybe I'm just catching them in between. Harvey had had a comment that don't they normally come in hundreds? Arbeard had a comment that maybe they always come in hundreds. Now I can't say I've seen them in hundreds but on this plant on its own, we have at least the ones that we can see, there's at least three. Now, whether there are any on me, Davi and Steve would have to check when I get into the car, won't they? <laughs> there's the even a tiny... Ah, so These Steve has just legs. told me that the little pepper ticks come in hundreds when they're babies. Now these guys look a little older than that, so that's why maybe they're not in the hundreds that we're used to. You guys know I like the smaller things, don't I? Anyway, I'm going to jump back in and let's... Ten seconds to the lines. Sure. I'm going to jump back in and I'm going to head up to the dam, like I said. So while I do that, let's go see some big, big cats.
Well, Trish, you better go to the dam. And of course, we have always said in Africa, or I think all over the world, water is life. You might be surprised, you might get something interesting by the water dam. Look at that ostrich, it's running for its life because what he just saw was the lions. He did not know the direction he was going. And as he was walking, he saw the lions. And what do you do when you see an animal that would kill you? And I'm calling it he because it's a male and he has made a U-turn and like, oh, I'm lucky to have survived. And you can see how he's looking. He's definitely looking at those lions. I would highly doubt the lions would be interested in him because they have enough to eat on that zebra and I'm sure so the lions know when these, bird, when these birds run they do fly low. They're very fast, fast as cheetahs, sometimes doing 50-60 miles an hour, pretty fast birds. And looking at this ostrich, look at the neck and the legs, he is very pink and that is what you call a breeding plumage for a male ostrich. And what he will be doing at the moment is to look for any girls out there who might be excited with him. And if anything happens, we'll see him just having a courtship with some females. But that's not the normal color of the ostrich. It's all, oops, it's time to have a poop break. It's always a bit dull in color, not as pink as it is now. But as it is, you can tell he is definitely interested all in that plumage where the girls could be interested in him and definitely they would start mating. Hello, Ostrich. That was quite skittish. You saw how fast he ran and definitely, I'm sure out of experience, they have known once in a while lions go for them. If he would get very close to those lions because there's quite a big number there. Stuff you say you just die on sight. I mean, you are not alone. I mean, that's a great comment, and that's quite scary. And even that ostrich, as much as he was walking towards that direction, either looking for food, be it flowers or some leaves or some grass or whatever he was looking for, and then boom, ten lions, and especially the male, definitely. He's much stronger than you, I would say, because he was able to gather his courage and run away. We're having some beautiful sunset and some vulture on top of trees there. And the lighting is just perfect. As the sun is trying to go home, the clouds look good. But you can see those two vultures there. Also, just like the ones we saw early on the ground, they're waiting for the killers to move away. And there could be another one that's coming to land. See how they land? Very good. And these are the African white-backed vultures. And I'm sure, M, um, you're enjoying this sighting. And you can see how they fly and land. And that's a torchwood tree, uh, rather the bosque tree. They may have to wait a couple of minutes until these lions leave. It could be much later because there's still a lot of meat left on that zebra carcass there. So we've got a combination of the African white-backed vultures. We've got the hooded vultures on that bosquier tree and what they have to do is to wait for the lions to leave this kill. And as I was saying earlier, you know, on a single sitting, a fully grown, you know, lion is about 20% body weight. Oh no, you say the amazing birds and especially when you see them in flight or when you see them landing on a tree like that. Well, this buffalo, I'm looking at this buffalo and I'm giving it an estimate of about 150 meters away from the pride of lion and you buffalo you have to be very careful i was just about to say well lions like this particular pride have enough to eat and they already got a zebra but should that ostrich have strayed itself and landed into them they will not waste a minute to bring him down and that could be the same fit to this particular buffalo. He has to be very careful, but I can tell you for a fact, he has no idea that these lions are there. They're just eating flat, you know, in the grass and they're blending so well. And he makes a mistake. These lions will like, you know, not necessarily because they're hungry, but lions have been known to take opportunities of when prey passes or gets very close to them. Let's see what this male will do. We're getting two, three females and trying to sneak on this kill and I'm sure this male is going to like growl and shout at them and get out of here. 
At one point, he stood up and I've been able to identify this one is the half tail of the three Kichwa males. If he stands up again, you notice his tail is like cut, is half, and we call him half tail. Of the three males of Kichwa males, to me, he is the biggest or he is the most handsome in terms of the mane and on the body morphology. Please remember to keep asking us questions. Or keep sending comments, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And this one female here must have eaten earlier. You can see her panting. And whoops, there she goes. And I've always thought it's not only males that always sleep for so many hours. People have always said lions will sleep for so many hours. Lions are very lazy. And I have thought, no. Even females, given the same conditions, the same circumstances, like the males, enough to eat, enough to drink, they would also comfortably go to the same period of time having a snooze. I mean, since I got here like 40 minutes ago, I've seen like the one having her legs up. She has been like that for the last, what, 40 minutes. Very good from my lions here, which will keep uh, eating and I want to stick with them for a little bit longer. Let's go back to South Africa to Trish, who has a bigger mammal than my lions here. Yes, I do. I've got a slow animal, but surprisingly they can cover vast distances. You think they're slow, but when they are angry, they can definitely move. I think up to 36 kilometers per hour check them out. So now we saw them from the road and they seem to have known that we were coming for a while. Of course they heard us with the big noisy car. Oh look at that. I always enjoy elephant sightings. It's actually been a while since I've seen some. Now we are quite close to the dam and it seems as if Everything today is just looking to cool down. <laughs> Shavat would like to know how much fun it is driving in the Jeep around here. So much fun, it is actually indescribable. It is it was one of my something I really really enjoyed so back home I have a little i20 which is a little Hyundai and it feels like a tin can compared to this it makes me feel powerful when I drive this thing very macho I do love it this is a tin can. even though this is a tin can but this is a bigger tin can bigger meaner tin can and I do I, I love it I love driving especially off-road it's quite fun now these elephants are kind of out of sight so I'm gonna move around just a bit to try and get us a better view of them okay let me do that now of course when we drive off-road we try our very best to be conscious of the vegetation around us but as soon as we go over, over most of these trees they'll spring right back up and we aren't doing too much damage. No. So. Oh, Jane, I didn't quite catch your question. James would like to know which grass species is most nutritious at this time of year. Ooh, that's a tough one to answer. I don't actually know. There's a lot of grass around at the moment. And, I mean, uh, elephants do prefer when the grasses are nice and green. It's always better for them. It's got nice and nutritious bits in it. Which one of those are the most nutritious? I'd have to conduct a few tests, I think. Steve says it's probably the buffalo grass. So it depends on the season whether elephants would eat the grasses or trees. Usually if it's in the winter and the grass is really dry and pretty much horrible, they will go for tree leaves and bark. 
but then again in the winter there's not a lot not very many leaves as well so when it's in the summer and the grasses are shooting up and they're fresh then the elephants tend to go for them mostly and then of course leaves so the it's kind of quintessential noise that we hear when we look for elephants are those breaking off the branches and that's something that I've heard a lot in winter and it's just amazing how it all comes together the longer we stay here in our knowledge bulls and in the summer like now I've heard it less so that tells me that the elephants are actually eating less of the bark around and of course that's obvious because it's been raining and everything's been much greener and much more nutritious anyway heading off to the dam now because I have lost the elephants unfortunately but we will get them back hopefully let me move now while I move off I've been trying to get to this dam forever but that's just how it is you want to stop for every little thing because it's all just amazing isn't it but while I do that and finally get to the dam, let's send you over to David. Very good, Trish. Keep moving, keep moving. The best thing I've always known when you're out in the African wilderness, whether you've got some game or not, is to keep moving because you do not know what you might meet next corner. Now, the party continues here and Halftail is not letting go. He has dragged the bigger part of the meat towards himself and you can see the lions or the lionesses rather are just on the edge trying to get small little bits of meat. But the main, I would say the main keg is being held by Halftail. And you can see from the color of the ribs there, this kill is pretty fresh. I would say it must have been today, either midday or in the afternoon when it was brought down. And assuming the rest of them have eaten and this male or half tail keeps eating, most likely it could have been like 12 o'clock or one-ish. I've always wondered, you know, if I would change to be a cat and more so a lion, whether I would want to be a female or a male, because chances are, as much as I did not see the takedown of this zebra, these females did all the job. And what happens is the males, once they land on the table there, they'll always push out the females. We've seen sometimes if they're cubs, the males, you know, unwillingly will always allow the cubs to feed fast. But they also tend to share. But as soon as the cubs are full and they're out on the other side, then the males come in. And the females, to me, who do the best job, will always come eating last. Well, I only saw one incident where I saw females that had brought down a zebra. Was it a zebra? Let me try to remember. I think it was a wildebeest. And... There were two young males, and the males came and tried to push the females out, and the females fought them back. Afterwards, after all settled down, I found out two of those females had small little cubs, and I think they had just to make sure they were eating to get enough milk to support their cubs, and that was very special. I mean, it was not normal, but as you go back to these lions before darkness catches us, in general, once the lions have noticed or have known that a prey has been brought down by the females. They'll always majestically march in there and push out the females. I don't know. Kalsik, very good question. Why do the lions, or why don't the lions react to the jackals as they do the hyenas? I mean, they can tell jackals are small little guys and they do not count to them. But they can tell, they know hyenas are a strong force to reckon with. And if the hyenas build in numbers, they have been known as much as whether the lions have eaten enough. Like that big belly we are seeing there, hyenas have been known to come and push the lions out of the kill. But now, as it is now, they know jackals are two, and jackals in general do not gang up in numbers. And jackals, I'm sure we all know they're monogamous. You already see them in twos, you see them in threes or fours, there's a puppy. But hyenas, it'll take one and they go, woo, 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 and two hyenas come in. Woo, and five hyenas come in. And a few more of those calls, there'll be 30 hyenas. And I'll tell you, Kalsik, the lions, will first try to stand their ground and try to push the hyenas out. But they cock up the tails, 
you know, ears raised up and they surge forward. And lions will always have one option to leave the kill. We have seen that very many times. Not very far from where we are, there's a particular clan of hyenas that we call the North Clan, and they're about 70 plus in numbers. That clan is fierce. They are fantastic, and any time they pick a kill from any lions, it doesn't matter to them. They'll always get there and they push them out. Archie tried to catch a hornbill there. There's a hornbill flying there, and it was a cascade hornbill. Thank you, Archie. It was a cascade hornbill that's heading to those big trees there. That's where they normally spend the night. They are those birds that tend to live in very tall, dense trees, and in general, uh, generally, it, they feed on fruit. And I'm sure that's where she was heading to. What an exciting to have this lion sitting, and you see half tail on one side and three females on the other side. He is holding, I would say, half of the meat on himself or by himself. And this female is just struggling to slowly get snippets. And the moment he pushes or he just stands up, they move backwards. The others are just rolling there and they don't want to even get close. Catherine, you see the mane is very fluffy, it's very true. Look at that mane and see how dark it is. I would say early in the morning, Catherine, we had some showers and I'm sure the mane got a little dis uh, disorganized and he has not maybe gotten a chance to go back to a salon. But yes, that mane is very fluffy, very large. Sometimes, Catherine, females have been known to prefer, you know, lion males that have large, you know, mane and sometimes a dark mane because they will always know or they think that they will sire cubs that are very healthy and but also possibly able to survive a drought and also sometimes able to survive diseases they're able to fight colds and uh, you know fevers and flus very easily and i think half tail is an example of those males and no wonder you know these females maybe have allowed him to join in the party and the other two I haven't seen them and not even one of my friends have told them have told me that I've seen the other two males. This meat is going less and less in weight and of course the lions are getting heavier and more so half tail. And I see his mohawk now just coming on his face. Keep eating uh, half tail, you deserve to eat. You have done very well in this area by protecting this territory and making sure the females have wonderful cubs. And I think Sydney is searching and searching. I have been searching almost everywhere in Torchwood and I can't find a single track of both Tandy and Talamba in Torchwood today. Maybe they are out somewhere in our property. So now I am trespassing, coming back to the side of uh, Juma. Oh, there is um, quite a, a lovely bird here. Oh, it's right here in front, so I'm just going to try and come forward a little bit to see if we can have a sighting. Looks like a juvenile a battalion. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to see it uh, nicely because of the uh, roof apologies. It is a lovely sunset from here where we are. It looks like uh, it's also raining in some of the areas far away from here. So far, still no sign of uh, Tandi or Talamba. Maybe uh, much further deep in the Juma side, we might pick up some tracks. Now, let's just hope for the best. Let's hope for the best.
<laughs> yeah, I haven't seen the leopards for quite a long time. It will be interesting to see them. It would be great if uh, both Tandi and Talamba are back on our side. So I'm just waiting to pick up just a small evidence in order to investigate where exactly they might be in this area. Maybe because of the sun, maybe they are somewhere in one of the drainage lines. So the only dominating tracks on the ground here so far from the beginning is the elephants. So the elephant is the one who has been just to everywhere. Elizabeth, I didn't get your question nicely. It's getting windy a little bit here where I am at the moment. <laughs> Elizabeth, we can't wait for that moment. All we want is uh, heavy rains to come here and fill our dams. So the heavy rains will do. Oh, look, there is a very interesting behavior here, which is done by uh, the uh, kudu I will show you just now. The kudu is eating the termite mound. So that kudu right on top there uh, was just eating the uh, termite mound. These animals, in order to have some supplements, they normally uh, have to eat the soil in order to get some iron. And in order for them to get calcium, you will see them eating the, the bones of the other old dead animals. So the behavior when an animal is eating the soil is called a geophagia. So you can see this um, kudu is very much inquisitive. <laughs> So now let's uh, cross over to uh, David, who's got the hyenas. Well done, with Kudu. And here the dynamics are changing and the ball game is changing. I'm not sure it was Karsik or who was asking me about the hyenas or why the lions do not push out the jackals if they come near the kill. Well, I have seen one, two, three, now six hyenas coming very close and what they're doing is very typical of hyenas scavenging. They're picking pieces of skin, they're picking pieces of bones and that's one hyena there on the run and the lions are trying to either, you know, stand their ground. That one is holding something, you see, that one is dragging either some skin of the zebra and what will happen here, the, you see the lions, you see that one chasing? It's the lion chasing them. Let's see what will happen here. Lion is gone. You did the job. Oh, why do these guys look at the hyenas going, going? Look at the run. They know. They know that. And the jackals are on the run. All these predators know each other very well. And yeah, I'm um, in the final control. Says awesome. So what these hyenas want to do is trying to intimidate the lions to leave the kill. If you look carefully now, our lions look different than what we were watching earlier. We are already in infrared. That's why they look black and white and our trees are not green anymore. And that's the beauty of infrared. What happens is we are able to see all this beautiful wilderness 
without shining any light that is artificial to them and without interfering with what they want to do and their characteristics remain the same, same behavior. So that hyena doesn't know we are here as much as you know we can see it very well and what she's trying to do is trying to get close to the kill but she has to be very careful and she knows just too well that she is just gambling also with her life she can either get the meat or she can become the meat herself so going stopping and of course thinking do i keep going or not remember very interactive safari we do your questions comments are very welcome hashtag safari live on twitter Well, the lions had woken up and I think the numbers of these hyenas were growing and were getting a little bit worried by that and they rose up there's another male there let's see what's gonna happen I think uh, second male of the Kichwa yeah of the Kichwa coalition could be on the kill now could be the one feeding so I was talking earlier of a clan of hyenas that we call the North clan that clan I respect them if they choose to come here, it will not take them more than five minutes to intimidate these lions and move them back and just have the kill. But I'm not sure what clan these hyenas come from. And they are like, you know, little, oh, that one's still pulling the skin. Look at that one. So what they have to do is to drag the skin away from the lions. I mean, Joy, thank you to hear your name and always a pleasure. Jumbo Jumbo, and I mentioned this is the marsh pride, and this is the marsh pride, and the males here, what we have are the Kichwa males, and the Kichwa males are always three, and I think that one there, I can't see him very well. I guess that could be Fang or the other one, but the one Joy facing the other side, that is half tail. I saw him earlier 100% before we went to infrared, that is half tail. And of course, that's the other male that forms the three of the Kichwa males, the coalition of the Kichwa males. So the one that is facing away half has been eating for the last 30 minutes. And I think he could be having anything like, tw oops, 20 kilos of meat in his tummy. And very characteristic, the males sometimes become a bit selfish and they'll always not allow the females to eat. And you can see how they are fighting the females on that kill going lurr, lurr. how amazing to see you know them having gotten a food for themselves and them just eating there so they hardly got a piece of leg there and what you do get your piece and move away as I said earlier if you're not careful these lions will come for you they might kill you I have not seen myself a lion eating a hyena but I've seen many hyenas being killed by lions Come on, go closer, get something for yourself. And here is where they say everybody for himself or herself. The one that was pulling the skin went in a different direction. The one running away got a leg, running in a different direction. And how beautiful is this? I'm just hearing now the frogs, frogs coming up and becoming more loud as darkness comes in. Come on, go close to the dining table, get something for yourself. Very good. I'm just going to wait and see how many hyenas will come close here and see how things will play out. But meanwhile, we'll take you back to South Africa to Trish. Trish is up to a lot. Trish has gotten her hands dirty. So we were talking about the elephants and their diet. So I thought this would be really interesting. We have finally arrived at Buffalo's Hook Dam and on the way driving up here, I found these two bits of dung, which I thought is a really cool comparison for you guys to see. So this is an older one, which would have been from around maybe actually maybe even a couple weeks ago it's quite old it's quite dried up I can pull twigs out of it 
very easily completely dry there's no moisture in here whereas this one and you can also excuse me you can also see the color is quite much redder orange just a little bit whereas this one is pretty fresh in fact I would almost say that it is might be from that herd um, it's still got a lot of moisture content and when I touch it I, I mean I can still see it I can push it in very very easily so now just a bit I still like it though I like getting my hands dirty so there we can see right into them now this one is where the elephant has been eating more nutrient-rich grasses and looking or well, has been eating more leaves and these things have been a bit more palatable in fact you can see that it's probably a bit more a bit better digested than this one is this one's got a lot of bark sticking out lots of dryness and of course the red color which is coming from the tannins which were in the leaves at the time when the elephant did eat it and of course the tree cambium that it had been eating which you know is um, very orange indeed in fact I tried some myself once it's got a bit of sweetness to it but I can't say I'd be eating it every day all day the whole through winter but I would definitely um, I mean if there was nothing else that's what you'd go for wouldn't you so the Excuse me. <laughs> Roshni would like to know how different they smell. Well, let's try it out. This one basically smells like soil in your garden. Very much like, yeah, just like soil. Very dry. Can't say it smells. Yeah, can't say it smells like anything very special. Very dry. In fact, that's the kind of impression it gives me. Where's this one? Smells a lot more pooey. <laughs> yes, it does. In fact, you know, it, it almost makes me want to make it into little balls, like a little dung beetle, and roll it up. It's very, look at it, so squishy. So squishy. <laughs> em says, please don't do that. I don't mind getting my hands dirty, Em. Max would like to know if the lack of water would change the dung. Well, that's actually a really broad question because the lack of water is what we experience in winter. So that is when we're having our dry season and this is what we're going to get. We're going to get elephants who aren't able to eat the grass because it's not nutritious at that time. So the dung is going to basically look like this. So it definitely does affect it. Whereas when there is a lot of water, you have more nutrient-rich grasses, more nutrient-rich leaves, and then you end up with dung like this. I think it's very cool. It's nice how you get to see these things and kind of tie them all together. Now this one does have a few beetles. <laughs> Emma suggests that I should give one to Sydney for a microphone. I think that these two are not up to Sydney's standard, to be very honest. He likes them round and full. These ones are a bit broken. Sydney has high standards, you see, especially for his elephant dung mics. But if you'd like me to, I can definitely keep this, keep this fresh one for him. I'm sure that would be very pleasant. Now, that is my little dung story here. I think it's very cool. Especially next to each other. You can really tell. Look at that difference. Very cool. Now, I can touch this because obviously it's a herbivore's dung. There's nothing in there, nothing dangerous that's going to hurt me. But up in the Mara, the dung of what David has, I would never touch. Let's see what he's got. Well, yeah, it's a little different, Trish, and he has gotten a little bit darker. And even use, using my infrared, the darkness has gotten in. And what's happening, it's become rather really difficult for us to see this lions very well because you can compare us in South Africa, we are one hour ahead of South Africa and that's why it has gotten dark much, you know, much faster here or much earlier than it is with Trish. Well, I'll be just leaving the lions now and moving on and finding out what has, we would see on the way, what I've heard a few minutes ago were just some hyenas cackling and trying to build themselves in numbers. The last I heard was, Ooh. 
And that's how they usually call each other. And once they build enough numbers, what will happen? They'll all get here and the lions will very quickly make a decision. Do we, you know, try them all or do we just move on? And chances are, I would guess the lions will just have to move away. Well, it's time for us also to keep heading out slowly, slowly. And we see what else we'll see on our way on the road. Dang, why will the hyenas will not will have their tails up like that, like the warthogs? The whole idea, they want to look big. And you see, you've seen or you have heard, I'm not sure, we don't have any polar bears here, but have, we have always been told, people are always advised, you're out there and you've got a polar bear. Try and make yourself look big and that way, you know, the polar bear might think twice. Uh, getting into the same thing we say here in Africa if you're walking and maybe a big animal like an elephant is coming to you try to look big maybe hyenas also they'll cock up you know the tails like that wanting to look big and then the lions will pose these animals look too big for us and then the numbers also that way it's an easy way to intimidate the lions so they'll cock up their tails and sometimes you get their ears also moving out or being blown out like that and the whole idea is just to look big to intimidate the lions and maybe that way they easily get the kill well beautiful beautiful sighting there we have had we're just gonna let those lions enjoy their dinner quietly because it's getting a duck and we move on and find out what else we'll see on our way very lucky it hasn't rained i don't want to talk so much a few days ago i said beautiful weather no rain today i don't smell it i don't expect any rain but what happened after that uh it took me a long time you know to forget we were hammered for about one hour non-stop by the rain i say so far so very good i still hear lots of hyenas trying to build in numbers and going towards that same direction yeah that was a heavy rain well i wish you could send you know some rains to south africa and more so to sydney who loves rain i am waiting for that rain uh, david i can promise you it's gonna make a very big difference here as the dams are not full at the moment i am right in the middle of the mulwati a drainage line going further west just to see if we are not going to be lucky with any of these leopards around here. So there's no sign of The Juma hyenas, the Juma clan, I haven't seen them for uh, quite a while now and maybe they are doing very well. So I'm not too sure if maybe um, Trishal is going to be heading towards the den as they tried yesterday and those hyenas were not there. They do go out for foraging sometimes. Uh, we do find them when they are there to nest the babies, but they also go out in order to forage. Yesterday they were out. Maybe this afternoon they might be back. <laughs> now it's December. Maybe they have gone on, on holiday. So uh, this is the place where Hosanna was also spotted at uh, this morning. Maybe it's still somewhere here as well. So now let's uh, go back to uh, Trishala uh, who is having a hippopotamus at the moment. I do have a hippo, 
Now, I find this quite exciting because I was just saying to Darby and Steve, a couple times I have driven up on them, they have seen me from a mile away and have predicted that I'll be coming and they were out the water in no time. So this guy, pretty excited that he's there waiting for me. Now you can see he has his eyes on us. He knows that we're definitely around, but he doesn't feel that we are threatened by him. Well, he doesn't feel threatened by us. Very cool. Now, earlier I wanted to go to Chitwa, and of course Sydney went to Chitwa, and now it seems that Sydney is trying to take Hosanna from us. He's truly making this a competition, and I am very competitive, so Sydney must watch out. How dare he, honestly? Now, but I've got something else to keep me occupied for now. Mr. Hippo, yeah, now. Yes, Hippo does also start with an H, so maybe we'll get closer and closer to the end of Hosanna. Oh, check that out. That is a terrapin on his butt. Very cool. Now, serrated hinge terrapins are notorious for picking ticks off um, hippos when they sit like this in the water. And I'm pretty sure that's what this guy is after right here. In fact, remember those ticks that we saw earlier? Maybe there's a couple of them on this hippo and he needs some relief, which this terrapin, of course, will offer him. Now, like we said, all these animals around you are trying to cool down because it has been so hot these last couple hours. Truly, truly hot. And even though I'm from Durban and I'm a Durban girl, I am still feeling very hot. Georgia would like to know how long hippos can breathe underwater. Well, hippos don't breathe underwater, Georgia. What they do is they come up for air. And they'll do this every five to six minutes. That's how long they can usually hold their bed for as an adult, whereas babies can only do it for about 40 seconds. And what's actually very cool is that they have the ability to close their eyes, ears, and nostrils while they're underwater so that nothing seeps in. And now when they even when they are sleeping, they have an automatic response that will pick them up to the water when they need to breathe and then they'll sink right back down. Very cool adaptations, I think. Now you can see the way he's sitting. He's got his eyes and his ears and his nose. All his essential senses can still sit right at the top even though the majority of his body is underneath. Helmet! would like to know where is Durban. Durban is what I call a, tropi a tropical paradise, even though James Henry will not agree with me. I think it's a tropical paradise on the east coast of South Africa. It is, yep, <laughs> it is on the east coast of South Africa and it is a very, very sunny, sunny place. In fact, what you see there, we see in Durban all the time. I think our, my Durban winter is about... Ooh, let us go to David quickly, who's got something very cool for you. Well, we got a bat eared fox here that's just about to disappear. It's quite an issue to spot them. And let me just see whether you very fast we can... Are we, do you think we can get it out? Let me just him try as if we reverse we can spot it again. But that was a bat eared fox, which is a very rare sighting to see at night. We'll see them during the day in their dens. And let's see very quickly if we can see where he has gone. He has gone to the right side. Uh, I'll first put my spotlight on there and see if they can see him. But in her inside. They move very, very quickly and definitely it must have come out its den or it must have been coming from somewhere and then it's going back home to the den. My guess is he's definitely uh, you know, going back to the den because they are not very safe. They know they should be back home by now and they have the worries of hyenas. Catherine, you say they are so cute, and I'm sure if you saw it, thank you very much. I'm happy. That's a great comment. They're very, very cute. And especially their large ears. 
when I look at all the animals in Africa and you look at the proportionality or the size of the ears compared to the body, you know, the ears are not proportional for the bat eared. They are huge because they need them. They need to pick every slight sound, you know, out here in the wilderness. And that's what helps them sometimes. They eat ants and they need to hear the movement of the ants on the ground where they are and they'll be able to go pick them up. But of course also the ears or good hearing will help them to be safe away from there would be predators like wild dogs or even hyenas. Well, that was quite exciting and very strange to see her alone because they'll always be going in small little groups. Well, darkness has fallen here and I just need now to have my spotlight out and keep looking left and right. That was some exciting moment to see a bat here fox at night. Quite special to see them at night. Personally, I see them more during the day than at night. And always hanging around near the den. Should there be any concern or, you know, an issue of safety or danger, they very quickly get in the den. But once in a while you see them out there foraging for ants because they love eating lots of ants. Well, Trish, tell us something. You were talking about Durban. You need to finish your story because we are all waiting and would want to know all about Durban. Ah, I'm so happy that you all want to know about Durban. There's two stories to tell you now. Of course, Durban, like I said, is where I grew up for half my life. And that is on the east coast of South Africa. And then the other half of it I spent growing up in Melbourne in Australia. So I have a bit of my heart here and a bit of my heart in Australia. But Durban is still my home. Now, thank you very much for asking by the way. It's always nice to get to know you guys and for you guys to get to know me a little personally as well. But we're all waiting for the Tingana story. It was so intense was much like a day like this, night like this, it was warm, the sun was out, it was just starting to set and we had picked up the drone and we are now going about. So here we are busy out of the vehicle on quarantine and Seb is the drone pilot and we have the thermal imaging camera being used. So we are so focused on looking, oh well the drone is so focused on looking at far away because it's far away from us now that we didn't see the leopard walking towards us. And all I hear is Troli say, Malume, leopard, leopard, Malume. That's not exactly how he says it. <laughs> <laughs> and the way we were standing around the car, I was next to Seb, so it was Tingana walking towards us. If Tingana had decided that I was his next meal, I would have gone first. I was the right in front of him. So there he goes walking towards us and James kind of instructs us. He says, okay, everybody stay still. Then he can continues to walk towards us. And now, you know, sweat starting to build up just a little bit, your heart's pumping just a little bit, you're still okay. You know, he's still far enough away. Um, and then he continues to walk towards us and now there's nothing between us. What we like to do is maybe keep a termite mound or drainage line or something between you so you've always got cover. Nothing between us. You've seen quarantine flat. He continues to walk and then James instructs us again. Okay, everyone against the car and then everyone sink down slowly. So that's what we did. Tingana must have come to within six meters of me. Six to eight meters of me before we started up the drone again to try and scare him. It did nothing. He just looked at it. He didn't even react to it. We thought maybe he'd paw at it or something. Nothing. And that was the first time it was. So now there's me, the drone between me and, and between me and Tingana, and he's there. He looked at me into my eyes. An incredible experience. Absolutely. It was, I couldn't even describe it, astounding. He looked at me into my eyes. So that was my Tingana story, favorite one. And of course, after all that intensity, he walks behind me and then he sits behind the car as if it's, you know, this is where he hangs out. What are we doing here? So 
H Macy says he loves she loves tr story time with Trishala. Well, I'm glad to hear it because I do like story times too. And the more we're here, the more we get these stories and we get this experience and it actually matters so much because it's one thing to know the biology of these animals and then to have these stories about them, that's something else. Something I really, really like. Anyway, story time is over for now and we shall move on. <laughs> Magic Dragon Wizard says, that must have been amazing. Magic Dragon Wizard, I don't even, I don't even think that is a good enough word. That was oh, truly, truly an experience. Lara Moore says Dingana is a character. He certainly is. The other time I can remember with Tingana, he was on a termite mound just before a rehearsal and he soared so close to me and that sound really goes through you it's not it's not a superficial sound it's not just you know it's as if there's layers to it there's layers to the way he's he's putting out the sound it really is amazing so i've had some great experiences with tingana and of course Hosanna when I came in for my interview that time. Ooh, looks like we're all sharing Tingana stories. You know, Sydney is really in a, trying to be in a competition with me today. But I hope he knows he's going to lose. And if he does lose, he's going to get some fresh dung for his dung mic. What do you think? I think so. So let's get all go over to him and see what he has to say about Tingana and his experiences with him. So look at that. This is quite a lovely uh, sunset. Uh, you can see the reflection of the sky there. Look at that. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see the sun going down. But uh, by look, oh, the impalas are just running away here where I am. Apologies for the poles. Oh, here on this side is all the impalas are just running away. I don't know what exactly happened here. All of a sudden, animals are not settled. Let me just uh, pull further here and see what is happening. Maybe there's something coming here. Maybe there's something coming. Let me just uh, check what's happening here. Because all these impalas just decided to uh, run away. So oh, maybe they are uh, just running away from uh, the other filming crew in the area. But that was uh, too fast. Uh, getting back to the sun, some few months ago I was out on a uh, game drive and we were checking and checking and following uh, Tingan. Tingana was hunting, and he got tired and decided to lie down on one of the termite mounds. When he was lying down there, there was a daker, and this daker was uh, running away from something. We didn't even see what happened. And the daker came straight to Tingana and went past by Tingana on a distance of this gap. That daker went past here, and when Tingana uh, 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 when Tingana saw that uh, something is coming, he was not too sure. He got a fright and the Deka went past and then he, he decided to follow a little bit and he couldn't win that battle. So a free meal came to him and he just couldn't see it. He did not see it coming. So now I am going to drive much more towards the house and I will end up by the Haina Den. Maybe we might be lucky with uh, something there. So maybe we, we are going to be uh, lucky with uh, one of the uh, lovely expected animals for today, hyena and a leopard.
Uh, all the viewers are greeting a quick sighting of Pat, <laughs> the, the recognized Pat. <laughs> Let me pass my greetings, Pat. The viewers are greeting you. <laughs> So these impalas are now settled here. Maybe it was not about anything dangerous. So now let's cross over to the Masai Mara where David is having some elephants at the moment. Well, it's good always to go to the Hainer Den because you never know what you see there. But I decided to stay on the road and Good Omen followed me after the lions because we got some herd of, you know, herd of alleys here with pretty young calves. And again, remember, we are already in infrared. That's why my elephants may look different from the normal elephants that you know. And the infrared helps us not to shine any artificial light to this beautiful beast of Africa, the African elephants that tend to eat and eat and eat when you talk of lions sometimes sleeping 18, 20 hours in a day, we have always said elephants also may eat 18, 20 hours in a day. Just to support that body frame, it means tons of food or kilos of vegetation to keep them going. Not forgetting they don't have the very best digestive or they don't put it to good use or what they eat. Hello there. You look a beautiful girl. Very good in fem good looking female there. She's a very huge cow by any standard. Not sure the one to eat is right is her calf. Ellie Lava, thank you very much and wonderful to see Ellie's in the dark. And if you're like me, Ellie Lava, just to let you know, uh, elephants are my favorite animals and as your name suggests early lava I would guess to you they are also your favorite animals and as you see to see them in infrared it's pretty special and you can tell how relaxed they are how you know quiet and how comfortable they are with, they are with us we are talking about what 20 30 meters away uh, from where we are and they are not bothered by our presence looking carefully at those two tusks you notice one is a little shorter than the other and I think at times I've said elephants are either left-handed or right-handed. Average, I'm not sure I got your question. Did you ask how do they get holes on their ears? Because if that's the case, that will happen maybe when they fight. I'm not sure I got your question very well. And once in a while, they will have those scaffolds, and you can see how sharp their tusks are. And by mistake, should they push each other, that would easily happen. And Emraj, also, if you look carefully, that particular girl, she is missing a tail. And apparently, some of them could be born with maybe holes in their ears, but also some could be born without tail. Just, just notice she only got a stump but either way she will also keep moving that stump because in her mind she got the reflex that she need to you know keep flicking the tail once in a while so that happens but also there could be a possibility maybe while young you know she was bitten by something could have been a crocodile when crossing the river could maybe have been a lion that tried to bring it down and the mother came in it could be anything in the background there. Are those more ellies or those are buffaloes? Yeah, those are buffaloes. And and yeah, they, they would hurt if I got that right. Uh, sorry, uh, and bring that question again about the tail of the elephant. Because all flies jumping up and down, all beetles because once the rain come, that what happens.
very good. I mean, uh, I would say for a fact it would hurt because there are a lot of nerves and blood vessels in that tail and definitely it would bleed and it would really hurt. So my guess is it would really hurt and I do not know how elephants sense or feel the pain but I'm sure with the nerves and all the blood vessels, you know, it would definitely hurt and they'd feel lots of pain in that particular area. But then they're very good or easy to recover and once that wound heals, then they're always good to go. Unka, how good is an elephant eyes at night? It's very good. They may not be able to see colors. They'll see light and, you know, dark shades or dark images. And I would say they easily or they could equally see just like human beings. We have walked out in the bush and we have pretended, you know, like in our villages to find out if elephants can see us and would stand and would see them trying to incline towards where we were and they would take off, you know, when we were small boys in the village. So Umka, I would say their eyesight could be as good as ours. Maybe, as I said, they may not see the colors, but they would see dark and light shades. You can hear one of them just rumbling there going, brr, brr. and that rumbling will always come from the throat. Jessica elephant tusks, are they a nuisance to them? I would say no, because Ellie's need them so much. You'd imagine, Jessica, if elephants want to bring a particular branch down, or like the marula trees, they want their fruits down. They sometimes need to knock the tree using the tusks, and they would say they are trunks are very delicate and they may not want to hurt their trunks by trying to force the branches down so Jessica would say their trunks are very important to them they don't feel them as a nuisance and ideally they need them and once in a while you have seen males fighting and going for each other so the tusks come in very handy to them and they would definitely use them a lot and you have seen elephants once in a while that don't have the tusks not looking as good or not looking as big as the normal elephants which means that the the task translates to very big benefit to the elephants now i want to leave them eating because the small little calves in this herd here and just let them enjoy their grazing as i head forward and maybe i'll be seeing something else interesting and I'm not sure they want to cross the road I might have to wait a little bit for a couple of seconds not to invent them and get into their space because I think one of the females is crossing the road and I have always believed that animals have the right of way. So this particular one is not even crossing the road but it's just walking on the road and I would call this a small roadblock for me and I would definitely have to respect their space. I think when I came to the Mara Triangle I found these elephants here and it's only fair that I can respect them and once of course they cross the road I'll be able to move on and we have always had this question David where did the elephants cross the road and yet this equal you know availability of food on both sides clever animals maybe the direction they're going they got some you know there's a watering point and they're going to have a drink and as much as they eat lots of food they also drink lots of water so I'm put on my light and I think they've crossed the road and I think it's time for me to move on okay wonderful elephants will never bore you elephants will always entertain you and they'll always be doing something whatever little they're doing elephants are always in action. I'm not sure whether Sydney has been lucky by the hyena den. I am now heading much more towards the hyena den area but still looking for uh, some lepers on the way. We might get there anytime soon. Let's hope the uh, hyenas are there together with the cubs playing outside. <laughs> I 
there is a, a hyena spotted not long time ago, or maybe now, somewhere around the of your telepen. So I am going to the den at the moment. There's quite a lot of hyena tracks where I am, or maybe it's a sign that there is a leopard in the area. So hyenas, they are a good sign of uh, those big cats, uh, such as the leopards in this area. Still no tracks of uh, Osana at the moment. And uh, now let's uh, go back to uh, Steve uh, with uh, some elephants. Let's go back to Trish. Splish splash, they were taking a bath. Yes, they were. Look at them. I'm so excited to find them. This is the female who's coming over to another little pan that we've got in the side here, but check out her tusk. Oh, she's just checking us out, making sure that we are okay. See how she puts her trunk up in the air. Hey girl, it's okay. See how she's twisting it about there. Hey girl, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Now we were a bit close. Okay. So that's telling me that she is a bit more relaxed now. She's starting to eat again, which is a good sign. So she's a bit more relaxed. You just needed to know that we're not going to hurt her or cause her or her babies any issues at all, especially since she's left them unattended at the hole to play a bit. Oh. Look at them. Look at this little one. Oh. Albeard says, what a great spa. It definitely is a great spa. You get a mud bath, you get a snack, you get a drink. Isn't that all the things we need? Now look at this little guy getting quite onto the edge. I was just going to say he's going to slip. Look at that. I always find it so interesting the way they can use their trunks. And of course the way the baby's trunks just seem to be flailing around. This is just a wonderful sight. Joy would like to know if this female is very old. Now I can see exactly what you're seeing, that the sides of her head and by her temporal area is quite pushed in, which may indicate that she's quite old, but her size doesn't indicate very old to me. Um, now elephants can get quite old, they have the potential to even be as old as 60 years old, but the skull here I'd say probably in her 30s. Now we are quite close, I mean, just a little hushed here, yeah? but of course that doesn't actually mean anything because she's heard us and seen us long before we did. It's just sort of a natural reaction I guess. There you can see her. She's still got an eye on us. Amal says he loves the sound of the evening. It is a beautiful evening. If I could describe it to you, we have... Firstly, the smells. I can smell the Ellie's. The Ellie's give up quite a distinctive smell. I can't really describe it. I guess it smells a bit like 
sort of a bit like their dung, which smells a lot like um, the plant material they eat. A bit sweet as well, a bit musky, but nonetheless very pleasant. And you can also hear the birds. There's a bird calling right here in this tree next to me. Now, there's a whole lot of them. Now, to me, they look like virtual starling on the side here, being a bit noisy. I can see them just up there, Darby. But they are jumping about quite a bit. Sorry, guys. We have this roof on just in case. It's blocking our view for now. But I will tell you that they are virtual starlings. <laughs> they are on the top. So that's what you're hearing. Philip would like to know if the night time makes Ailey cows more defensive. Well, firstly, elef elephants don't quite have very many predators that are going to go after them in the first place. They are huge. They are the biggest land mammal that we have. Um, so they're not in particularly lots of danger in the first place but at night the bush changes quite a bit so the predators that are out they're kind of during the day they can be very scared of us or um, intimidated by us coming along and if we had to jump off the vehicle they would very likely run and that goes for lions and leopards but in the evening things change a little bit at this baby getting right down in there. Wonderful sight. <laughs> I love snacks says that this baby Ellie keeps spilling. Well yes he does. He or she actually. Just remember they've got this huge apparatus coming out of their face. And they need some time to be able to find out exactly how to use it and master it. Think of it as playing a new sport. It's hard at first, but before you know it, you'll be picking up peanuts with your trunk, much like mum does. And all this, especially with mammals, this type of play and experience is very, very important because that's how they grow and they learn. So it may be a bit comical, but it is essential to this little baby's survival. Now, I think I might have a bit of an early roadblock myself because I don't want to scare them and starting off the vehicle might do that. So I'm going to sit tight. In the meantime, it seems that David has finally gotten through his. Well then, Trish with the Ellie's and you know, any day you see Ellie's or like Ellie Lover said, is always a wonderful day. I left to my Ellie's and it said that I need to move on. It's a chance for maybe other Ellie's or something different. I'm an area that have once in a while seen lions. And there's a particular pair of lions around this area that is called the Ololola Pride. And they tend to come out at this time of the night. And in this particular area, for one reason, there's a lot of prey in this area. And two, uh, there's some water there's a little spring that never dries out so they'll always hang around here and I've always chanced them seeing them around so that's why I have to drive very carefully looking left and right and seeing if I might be lucky to see some so far nothing but you never know so the whole idea is just to keep looking or maybe scrub hairs be a good thing to see there's something i want to struggle and see whether it can be able to catch this could be a very difficult mission for archie but if it works out fine if it doesn't we'll move on it's just some ants on the road uh are she gonna walk me through and i just shine my light there those are the ants there tell me what you want me to do or do we keep going those are the ants there can I just stop there? 
Uh, we are in infrared, and let's see Archie's magic and fantastic. You've even done better than what I would think. Yes, this is magical camera work here, yeah? and these are what we call the safarians. And we call them safarians because they are always on the move. I should want my light off. Hopefully that makes things better. Very good. There they are. And we call them safarians, as I said earlier, because they are always on the move. Unfortunately, they are on the road, and I'll take responsibility of running over them, and not only me. It's kind of uh, things that will happen to many of these beautiful animals out here in Africa. This is where the road is and always in motion and there are thousands and thousands of them and this one reminds me of the migration Lorena, great comment and that loads of ones you say and yes there are so very many Lorena and I'll tell you Lorena one thing you do not want to be bitten by any of these ants. What happens is you walk through them and you can easily pick them on the soles of your shoes and when you do that they don't bite you. What they do they just crawl up and of course they feel not right when you walk over them and they keep crawling up crawling up and at one point when they can't move anymore that is when they bite. Now the biggest bite will come from the males and once the males bite they have very strong fangs and those fangs just lock and when they lock there's no way even if you try and pinch the abdomen or the tail or try like to you know to rub it out they do not let go and what happens is when you try to pull them out of your body the better part of the body comes out and the head or the fangs remain you know glued into your body and the fangs still locked and that's one pain you don't want So, safari ant, they are getting now a lot of insects that they'll be feeding on. And they just don't want to stay here for long because I might also pick them the tires and they end up on me and Archie and we might be in a lot of trouble. Well, we go back to South Africa to Trish because he's, or rather her Ellie's are very thirsty. I am still with my Ellie's. I can't leave the spot. It's so beautiful. Now, we were talking about the different ways, well, rather the flimsy way and clumsy way in which the little calf uses his or her trunk. But let's look at the way mum uses hers. Look at the way she can twist the bottom. Very cool. Now, earlier we could actually hear her sipping up through the water, through her trunk like a straw. Now she's flicking her trunk around. Hey girl, it's okay. It's okay. She is very, very interested in us. And that's quite understandable because she's got a little baby coming behind her. So we want to let her know that she is completely secure and that most importantly baby is completely secure oh look at him peeking through the bushes hello look at this tiny trunk I love we, often these little Ellie's will come and give us a little bit of a charge so they're also interested in who we are and what we're doing around them. Uh, he'll usually take his lead from mum, so mum's been curious about us, and that's why he or she is equally. Getting a feel for those nutritious grasses. Lara Moss is so cool. Gosh, I can think of a hundred ways to describe this. In fact, why, why don't you use the hashtag Safari Live and give me your one word tweet on what you think this feels like or what you feel when you see this rather. Hmm, what would mine be? 
Ooh, nice. Ooh, look at that tail. I don't know what mine would be. I'm feeding so many things. I think I'd have to use my favorite word, incredible. Really, credit cannot be given to it. It is uncreditable. It really is such a view. I mean, you've got the bush in the background and look at that sun setting as well, just behind them. Now what I can hear and actually feel are low, low rumbles coming from mum. Now that's quite amazing, you can feel that. They can communicate vast distances. Some of the numbers can be a bit extreme, but from what I understand, it's probably about 4Ks, 4 kilometers that they can hear these things go. Bulk, Bulk's one word tweet is adorable. I do think it's adorable. That little baby is absolutely adorable. But I must say, we have to include mum's reaction to us in this tweet, you know? So was mum very adorable? I'm sure she was in her time too. <laughs> we were all cute once. Lara Moore says, paradise. I am inclined to agree with that one very much so. I mean, like I said, the bush in the background, the sunrise, sunset behind it, and these elephants with the ears going behind it as well. It really is something. Oh, I could spend every evening like this, I think. Not too shabby at all. Connie says tranquility. Definitely when they were down there by the waterhole. Definitely. In fact, there's still a little guy who's busy chowing down. Remember we were talking about the dung earlier. Now if you watch him, he kind of goes for the lush leaves, which is we said what they would go for when it's the summer time and it's a bit more wet. Sure. And then the bottom, you can see every now and then he picks up some of the grass from the bottom. Now we are just going to swap over to infrared because the light is leaving us just a bit and this will give us a nice um, image of them without having to put any sort of artificial light on them so they're completely in their natural environment and there we go it's not too bad it is magic all of the things in this place are magic i think in fact i change my one word tweet it would be magical On my magical note, look, at this. can't wait for the stars to come out and then you have like fairy dust and unicorns coming out here, it'll be so magical. But in the meantime, Sydney has, I think, a fairly magical creature himself. Sorry about that, or maybe not so sorry, because now you get to experience the Ellie's again. Like I said, I could sit here all day and watch them. Now I think, now I actually think this is mum with, with a few of her calves. The little one looks quite tiny. Whereas this one looks maybe between four and five, which would make sense. I was actually quite glad that he, she came to investigate us before she moved on because she has walked off. And this tells me that she's actually quite comfortable because 
She's left little one here. Now, just then, I don't know if you saw that, but he was very, very still. Now, often when they're very still and then they start to move, they've been communicating in a, an infrasonic way that we won't be able to hear. Oh, look at him displaying his girth, I suppose. Trying to push over this tree. Oh, shame, little guy. Not yet. So my Ellie's have walked away and they've decided to say good night to you. And in the meantime, let's get David to say his final goodbyes as well. Well, I have stopped here and just trying to watch from that side. I thought I had seen some either an animal move there, but I can't see it anymore. I don't know what it was, but I was guessing it could have been a savo cat. I'm just waiting to see if the eyes will pop up again. And maybe if they don't, it is still wonderful that we have been waiting for Ray to come out. And how nice it has been to have all of you with us today, both from South Africa and here in Kenya in the Mara Triangle. It has been such a wonderful afternoon to have all of you with all your questions, with all your comments. Fantastic. And those lions, especially that I saw having that zebra. That was an amazing thing I've not seen for quite some time, and especially having the half tail who I had not seen some time. We might be going back to chance if that savocat might come out, but I truly want to thank everybody for having joined us today. And that's exactly where that savocat was. And it's not there, but you never know. Sometimes these animals disappear and then they show up. Well, on behalf of all the colleagues, Trish, Sydney, myself, and all the camera operators, we thank you and to all of you, have a very good one. And from all of us, goodbye.